is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. When Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized, this confuses John, because that's not how he expected it to go. To make sense of why this does make sense, we got to look at what baptism is. We understand it to be doing many things, both it's the washing away of sin, dying to sin, rising to Christ. We talk about it like that. It is also important to remember it in context of Jesus' theme, the theme he comes back to again and again in his preaching. How often does Jesus say, repent for the kingdom of God has come near? Or, a par let me tell you a parable that the kingdom of God is like. That Jesus is always coming back to the kingdom of God. It is his central theme of everything he's communicating and preaching. And so there's a connection here. When Jesus is baptized, uh, he is baptized as the first in this kingdom, right? He is the, the king of this kingdom. He is first to be baptized. The Spirit comes down upon him. And everyone who is baptized after Jesus, this is how they are baptized. The Spirit comes down in, in baptism. And, and so what we're doing when we are baptized... It is yes, we're washing away sin. Uh, yes, we're accepting uh, that we are forgiven. We are also accepting that we are citizens in the kingdom of God. And this is an important uh, just idea to chew on. Paul reminds us, it's in Philippians 3, that our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And, and that's a pretty impressive thing to, for Paul to say. Is not a Roman citizen just by default. Like we, we've gotten used to the idea that if you're born in America, what, what's your citizenship? It's American, right? That's not how it was back then. If you, the only people who had citizenship in Rome were Italians born in the right part of Italy. Unless Rome needed money, in which case you could buy citizenship if you paid a very significant and hefty sum of money, right? And if you bought citizenship, what you were buying was the right to be beheaded instead of crucified if you betrayed the state, and a right to a trial. And if you watch what uh, what happens when Paul gets arrested later, they're going to treat him one way. He says, "But wait a minute, I'm a citizen." And everyone goes, "Whoa, okay, we won't mess with him. He's a citizen. We'll, we'll send." them off to Rome. And so citizenship back then, it was not a given that everyone had it. Most of the people in the Roman Empire were not Roman citizens. They were just servants or slaves, or they had literally no rights. And so Paul, whose family has bought Roman citizenship, for him to say that there's something even more important than Roman citizenship, it's citizenship in the kingdom of God, that's quite the, the, the thing to say. And what the difference between this Roman citizenship, which you have to buy in the kingdom the citizenship in the kingdom of God is that citizenship in the kingdom of God is a gift it's free you accept it and it is given to you and, and, and notice that um, the nature of becoming part of a, a citizenship in a kingdom is who's in charge the king, right? It, it, we're, we're, what we're saying when we're, we're going to be citizens, we are accepting in baptism that we are citizens in the kingdom of God. We're, we're committing ourselves that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven, we have a lot of confidence in, in what the king wants to have happen. Now, we don't know everything about what this kingdom is like. We're, we're not there yet. The kingdom of God, as Jesus puts it, has come near, but has not come in its fullness. And so the nature of the kingdom, there's a lot that we don't know. There's some that we do. The prophet Isaiah tells us that this king, that this, this servant, this king, will act such that a bruised reed will not be broken, such that a dimly burning wick will not be blown out. Think about how gentle that is, so that grass that's bent over need not fear be broken, or a candle that's barely lit is not going to be blown out. Right? That's how this king acts. That because of the king acting this way, that there will be justice for all the nations, as those who follow this king are sent out so that prisoners will be brought out of dungeons, and from prisons those who sit in darkness. 
That, that's the nature of this king. Jesus is the first in this kingdom, a kingdom in which justice is done, a kingdom that Jesus talked about all the time, a kingdom that we accept, that we are citizens of in our baptism. A kingdom that sends people out to be light in the darkness, to open the eyes of the blind, to make justice a reality. So, you ever hear someone say that the church should never be involved in politics? Yeah, we really can't do that, can we, and take what Jesus is talking about seriously. To read scripture seriously, to follow Jesus, is to be involved in politics, to be involved in politics because Jesus is involved in politics, right? We follow Jesus as citizens in the kingdom to come, and the kingdom that has its own distinct sense of politics and policies and a way of living. A politics in which the blind are given sight and the prisoners are set free, such that bruised reeds need not worry that they will be broken. So Andy, if we're going to be involved in politics, how do we do that? Well, the answer depends upon what century you're born in. Right? That question has been answered in profoundly different ways depending on where you are in the history of the church. Like, if you go back to uh, the earliest church, they had inherited the idea that the king was the, son, was the first person who's responsible to God, and then the king trains all the people in the kingdom to follow God, and, and that uh, everyone in the kingdom is of the same faith. Right? If you go back to the Old Testament, that's what it was. It, somebody called it theocracy. I'm not sure of the exact terminology. But it was a bunch of Jews being Jewish together following God. And so that's what the, the church had inherited. And it looks around in the first century Rome and says, well, that's not going to work. And so the first centuries of the, the church, the stance between church and state was simple. You don't mess, them, mess with them because they'll kill you. That's it. Right? Paul never gives advice on how a Christian should exercise political power because it is unimaginable that a Christian could have political office. It just didn't happen. Christians weren't soldiers because you can't be a soldier and for Rome because Rome is the group that Roman Empire will persecute and kill Christians if Christians raise their heads. And part of that is... The way you pledged allegiance to Rome is you burned, burned a pinch of incense, an act of worship, and you said, Caesar is Lord. And so you have all of these Christians who are, who are saying, Jesus is Lord. It's the most political statement you could make, right? Jesus is Lord. No one else. Jesus is Lord. And so that's what the early church was saying. Jesus is Lord, so they can't be soldiers. They're not involved in politics. They're just church and state are like, we're just over here trying to survive while the state tries to kill us. Okay, that's how it starts. And then it changes in the Middle Ages. It changes for reasons that we'll get into another sermon. Um... It changes so that the church understands itself to be the ultimate authority. Who crowns kings in the Middle Ages? Anyone know off the top of your head? Who actually puts the crown on their head? It's the Pope, right? Because the Pope is in charge of everything in Europe. Everything. And so the relationship between church and state is the church is like the beneficent Lord who will allow the kings to function and, and wield your power. And, and so that's why... When Anyone know off the top of your head when this breaks down? Who was the first person to crown themselves? It's Napoleon, right? Napoleon... Charlemagne did? I want to hear more about that. It is my understanding, and I could be wrong. I've told you before I reserve the right to be wrong. I might have exercised that right now. That's all right. We will consult the Google in about 10 minutes. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that all of Europe lost their ever-loving mind around Napoleon is when Napoleon was crowned emperor uh, of the French, he had the Pope show up, and instead of handing the crown to the Pope to crown himself, he crowned himself in front of the person who had crowned everyone else in the room. And, and so that from that reign, Napoleon 
oh, let's see, what year is Napoleon? It's like 1700s. From like 400 to 1700, the relationship between church and state was the church will let the state rule. Right? So the church has vast authority. And, and then there are some other arguments that start coming up in that time. Luther, Martin Luther, starts the Lutheran church. He starts arguing that there's the church, and then there's the state. And, and so let's just keep the two apart from each other, and they just don't talk to each other, and they're just their own two different things, completely separate. And then Calvin, at about the same time, uh, John Calvin, he, uh, the who starts like what's called Reformed Theology, so modern day Presbyterian, Baptists, etc. He argues that like, instead of church and state being separate or the church being in charge of the state, he just says, let's just get rid of the state and have the church be in charge of everything. If you lived in Geneva, where Calvin had started his little experiment in church-state relationships, you know who was the ultimate authority? It was a group of five pastors. Was there anyone under the five pastors? Nope, there was no state authority. It was just five pastors who told everyone in the city everything. They were just ultimate authority and ultimate control, and that was that. And so we have all these different understandings of church and state and how they relate. And then we get into modern times where we are children of the Enlightenment, which says that church and state can have a little bit to do with each other, but not much. But we're not sure how much, and so we end up debating about it all the time. And that, that's the history, right? And so the funny thing is, if you'd ask Christians at any point in history how church and state should relate to each other, they would have told you what they were doing is right, and that's what's going to last forever, and it did last until it didn't, right? And so we have these big chunks of time in which church and state are relating in different ways. And so what we have today is a mess. That's the technical term for it, right? We have a big mess. Because as Christians, we do not agree even about what we disagree about when it comes to how Christians are involved in politics. We have chunks of Christians who want to go like the full Calvin, Geneva, church should be in charge of everything, restorationist, church should be church, 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 right? I, I see those Christians today. I see Christians who are taking the Luther approach. So, and, and we see each of them having their way in different ways. Like, so that if you want to look at the way that the state does control us in a lot of details, like how fast can you drive down the highway? 65 miles per hour. Why is that? Because the state doesn't trust you to drive slow enough, right? And, and so we have elements of this, like the church, the, the idea that the church should control, control everything about everyone's lives because we can't be trusted to do what is right. There are ways that that shows up in our modern politics. We can only drive so fast because we're not trusted not to drive too fast. And then there's like Lutheran aspects of it, like where you keep church and state as separate as you can. And, and so I see that in like the death penalty. We follow Jesus who was crucified with the death penalty of the day, right? And so we kind of have problems with that. The state uses the death penalty to this day, but we really don't get up, uptight about it because that's the state and this is the church, so we just keep the two separate. Okay? I see Christians arguing that. And, and then I see Christians like in this sort of in the enlightenment mode saying, you know what, we have to have some involvement. Do, do we pay property taxes on our church here? Nope, right? We, so we see aspects of that. that they're sort of, so the, we, the church and state have some involvement, but not too much. And, and so we, it's just a mess, right? Christians are, are taking different points of view and different approaches to being involved in politics. And I don't expect it to get clarified any time this century. I, I don't expect like some sort of Billy Graham II to show up, call every Christian together in America and say, this is what we should do. And everyone to go, yeah, that's right. We, sh we should do that, right? It's, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> and so... And even if that did happen, I'm not sure we would be happy with the results. Let, let me give you an example. Like, let's take one of these models and let's spin it out and see what it would be like. Let's say that sort of the Geneva Calvinists, let, let's say every Christian in America agreed to that. And we voted for a new political party called the Christian Should Be In Charge. Wouldn't that be a great party name? The Christian Should Be In Charge Party. And, and we elected that. New president, new senate, new house, everything. Christian Should Be In Charge Party party. And, and it is a Christian belief that life is sacred, right? Can, life is sacred, everyone, we can agree to that. Right? You know, um, 
okay, and, and it, with, with this approach, we don't trust people to do what's right, so let's just outlaw anything that ends life. Right? We need to outlaw things like diet soda, because that, maybe that really doesn't, outlaw soda and diet soda, get rid of all soda, and, and let's get rid, rid of all abortion, let's get rid of all handguns. Right? If you look at the gun statistics, 4% of deaths are caused by long barrel weapons. It, it, it's actually 96% of deaths caused by guns are called by handguns. And so if we want to just get, preserve as much life as possible, get rid of uh, coke, abortion, and handguns. Now, does that sound like a great idea? Everyone going to vote for that? Is that? I could take any of these sort of political stances and spin it out, and you're going to give me that same look. Andy, you've gone crazy. I get used to it. But... I don't think we're going to have a clean sense of how church and state should be involved with each other any time in our lifetime. And so that leaves us with the question, what do we do? First, we have to acknowledge that we live in a mess and there's going to be this continued disagreement about how church and state relate. Second, I don't think we can duck out. I don't think that we can just not be involved. It is too important to our life together to not, for Christians not to be involved in politics. I believe that Christians need to run for office, and Christians need to vote, and Christians need to vote. Christians need to vote in line with their beliefs. And so I hope every single one of you votes this year. Right? Here's your please go vote sermon. It's a few months early. I hope I'm done with politics after this sermon. Uh, the Johnson Amendment is still in effect. It's illegal for me to tell you who to vote for. And I wouldn't do it anyways. Now, if you want to talk about it, we'll go get coffee and we'll sit down and shoot the breeze. But, but I'm not going to tell you, right? So I believe that we have to acknowledge that it's a mess, that we do have to be involved. We need people of Christ-like character involved in our politics. And third, we need to remember that we have a dual citizenship. How long are you an American? For a lifetime, right? How long are you a Christian? Forever. America is good for now, for however long now is, forever long your lifetime is. That's how long America is good. How long is it good that you are a follower of Jesus? It's good for an eternity. And so please hear me when I say, we support America, and we do the best for America in this lifetime, and we do it knowing that America is good, the kingdom of God is eternal. Thus, when we engage in this conflicted, messy, confusing politics as followers of Jesus, we do it with an eye to the fact that we follow someone with eternal implications, and so whatever approach to church-state relationships you want to have, and I would be intrigued to know, right? Whatever political party you support, whoever you vote for, our ultimate allegiance is to the king who, as the prophet Isaiah puts it, lives such that a bruised reed need not fear be broken, such that a dimly burning wick will not be blown out. That is the bar set for our behavior in politics. That's the standard we're called to as Christians. Be involved, be involved to the best of your understanding, and be involved in such a way that a bruised reed will not be broken. That is a particularly challenging thing to ask, especially during this time, because what has become the politics of the day? Modern political parties have taken an approach of what's called mobilizing the base. It is, it, it's a hope to get people angry and afraid so that we won't talk to them, we won't listen to them, we vote for the people that we trust and we don't talk to them, we post memes and pictures and arguments on Facebook that make people who agree with us angry and hack off those who don't agree with us. God save us from Facebook. And as followers of Jesus, do we have the luxury of having an us and a them? Because who is them? They are our neighbors. And what do we do to our neighbors? We are called to love them. Right? The best comparison I can make is to playing sports when the other team is playing with poor sportsmanship. How hard is it to keep on playing with good sportsmanship when the other team is not? 
That's the nature of Christians involved in politics today. We are going to go be involved in politics this year. The stakes are high. We have to do it. How we comport ourselves matter because what is even more important than who is president is who is king. We follow Jesus. We confess that Jesus is Lord. And that's where we're headed. Right? My first sermon here, I told you that the most interesting and important thing I will ever say is that Jesus is Lord. It's still true. It's still what I say. Jesus is leading us towards a kingdom in which all are welcome. From everyone we will ever meet is welcome and invited to have citizenship in that kingdom. The people we expect to the people that we do not expect. And because we confess that Jesus is Lord, we are sent out as ambassadors of that kingdom into this day, into this age, into this time, to live such that a bruised reed need not, be, not fear be broken, such that we can love our neighbors no matter who they vote for. Amen.